This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week is an associate editor at Reason Magazine, where she writes about precisely what you're not supposed to write about. This is my interview with Elizabeth Nolan Brown. So I'm at the Reason offices in Washington, D.C. with uh, Liz Brown, Elizabeth Nolan Brown, who's a staff writer, associate editor, sorry, here. And Liz, you and I actually have only met once before, which is very strange, which we'll talk about later. But uh, so I'm going to do two things with you. I'm going to make an argument later that you deserve a Pulitzer Prize. But I want to get into something a little heavier right now. So you, you've taken a position on something that's pretty important to me. Is it, and I want just a straight answer and try to be honest here. So is it, do you say La Croix or do you try to say the French? <laughs> um, well, I can't help it. I thought it was the French. This is, by the way, is the easy yeah. question. So it's, it's going to get was tough the French, in a second. I thought it was the French way. So I don't, and then oh. I learned that it is just La Croix. So oh. I try to remember to say it now, but I always want to say La Croix or some like weird so thing. So for months you were walking around saying La Croix? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, okay. Okay. So that's the easiest question. Now here's a tough one. Okay. Which is it? Which flavor? Oh, that's hands down. The, uh, Wait, oh. just don't be so cavalier. Oh, this okay. is, this is, okay. I'm getting Sorry. nervous here. This is a big deal for me. <laughs> Go ahead. Which? Coconut. Oh my God. Oh, okay. Oh, God. Okay. Followed it by, obviously, second best key lime. Oh, Jesus. Okay, this is really going badly. <laughs> um, I don't think you deserve the Pulitzer anymore. <laughs> it's like what, my what, two what, least what favorite. Your, oh, what are yours? Oh, it's obviously peach pear is number one. Mm. Oh, apricot is very mm. good. Strong second. But what? Coconut. Can we agree that berry is terrible? Berry's like... It's in the lower half, I would say. I wouldn't say it's terrible. You have really terrible taste. <laughs> I... I, I'm a little, I don't know really what to do now. Should we just talk about politics? <laughs> well, clearly, yeah. Something lo- less controversial than uh, La- LaCroix. Isn't it good though? Like, what did they do? They just found like good flavors or something? What? And, and they just, How? Brought, it's just like, do you remember? Clearly Canadian. Yeah. It all yeah. sucked. Oh, is that the good one? You're well, saying? no, but I loved it as a kid. But I mean, but this is so much better. But they, they, people have been doing this for decades, and they've all kind of sucked. They've been sort of mediocre, and all of a sudden, this one comes along. They're so much better than all the other s- flavored sparkling waters. How could that be? Do you have the inside story on this? You're a journalist. You should know. No, okay, we'll move on. Here's why you should win the Pulitzer <laughs> Prize. <laughs> well, you n- probably know why, but um, not for my knowledge about Lacroix. No, no, you, alas, you're going to go to prison for that. But no, I mean, there's. Um, Am I right that you're the only one who covers sex work in a serious way as a journalist in this country right now? No, there's there's some people who bullshit. Melissa Gira Grant, who she she wrote a book. She does not cover it as a reporter the way you do. She doesn't cover it as a as a regular thing the way you do, and hasn't. For, there are not a lot of people who do it as a regular thing. I'm very excited when I see like one off articles from various places that are yeah, yeah actually not, sort of uh, taking a. You have, serious look at this. You are way, way, way ahead of everyone else in this particular field of journalism in this on this topic, the subject. I mean, way ahead. And, you know, you've broken, I mean, you've broken news, you've reported news, you've done tons of analysis and commentary on it, just more by far than anybody else for the last, what, three or four years it's been now? Five. Five years yeah. of doing sex work, reporting yeah. and writing. 
gosh. Um, and you do it extremely well. And I think you're one of the major, one of the major reasons that sex work, the sex worker movement is now becoming legitimate and mainstream. Uh, I think you've helped to get the word out quite a bit. And I, I applaud you for that. But I also think um, it's just that's what the Pulitzer Prize should go to is journalists. I think it's supposed to journalists who cover things that other journalists are afraid to. Well, uh, thank you. I'm very flattered. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, I don't want to take any credit for, you know, the sex worker rights movement, which has been just doing like so much organizing and doing so much like so much to get out there. I think that where I have made an impact is in getting other journalists to look critically at human trafficking hysteria. Um, I think that there's, yeah, a lot of people who just used to sort of, and, and I've had like so many people in, in various, you know, mainstream journalists always tell me this, that they used to just sort of be like, okay, whatever, when they saw those headlines, because why would they even think twice about it? But now through, yeah, through knowing me and reading my reporting, hmm. that they actually do stop and See, I was sort right. of look critically at it. So I think that's, that's important. Good. <laughs> well, come on. I mean, you do acknowledge that you're the only one doing this, really. I mean, and it's it's not surprising, right? Because it, it's you know, I I've been I've been working on this topic myself for God, I guess, ten years now, in a serious way, both as a historian, an activist, and a journalist. Um, and I would say it's only been in the last couple of years where I've like forgotten who my sex, what my sex worker friends do for a living when I'm talking to them. You know what I mean? Because it, they just, it comes with such a taint, such a stigma. It's so yeah. powerful in society. It's so deeply ingrained in us, um, even among a lot of sex workers, right? And that's one of the things they battle against. So people um, ask me, like, and I don't really have the answer, why do you care so much about this particular topic? And I, I mean, I can get into that, but I'm more curious about, and I don't know, so I don't want to talk about it, but I'm really curious about you, why you do it. I mean, you're, as a, someone outside of that world, why are you so interested in it? I mean, when I, so when I came to Reason, I definitely, and I've, I've always been interested in just sort of the sex worker rights movement and, and just in sex work in general. Like I used to read all the, all the stripper memoirs and stuff. As oh, well. yeah? Um, and, you know, what do you mean? Spread. All, wait, sorry. All the stripper it was, memoirs? It was like during the like, you know, the late 90s and the early 2000s this. when the like, it was like the confessional memoir chiclet like bonanza. Mm. And it was just like, hmm. yeah, I mean, there were, there was like, they were like a dime a dozen. A lot of them were bad, but. The good ones, you know, like Lily Barana and Diablo Cody. Okay. Um, now I'm yeah. starting to know what you're talking yeah. about. Okay. I was in graduate school having no fun then, so I don't know about those things. <laughs> there was I was a, in high okay. school and yeah, in college and I started and I started reading like Spread magazine, which was a big sex worker rights magazine back then. And so I've always been Why? Uh why? Yeah. I don't I don't know. Yeah. I, was, I was interested in it. Isn't that odd? I mean I and I, I dabbled in a lot of a lot of stuff when I was in college. What do you mean? Starting, like starting with the art modeling, you know. The what? The, the nude art modeling. Oh, the nude Ooh. art. You, you were a nude? Yeah, figure, yeah. Being you a were model. a nude art yeah. model. Okay, okay. Did you do sex work? Uh, I did. I worked at a strip club then starting in college. Okay, so, yeah. okay. Uh, and that is, yeah, what got me, I guess, interested. But I was sort of, I was reading about this stuff before that. And it was, it was almost like a reverse. Like I was like. This is cool. Like I want to, I want to go work at a strip club now. After sort of reading the sex worker rights uh, stuff around it, so you were you had the intellectuals' approach to life, <laughs> <laughs> right? You read about it first, you think about it for a long time, and then maybe you try to do it in real life. I don't think I thought about it for a long time though. Actually, I was. Uh, well, that's just the way I. Did. I was. I was painting dorm rooms, hmm. and it was terrible. Yeah. And I was. I was a theater major, and so I couldn't. I wanted to be in this play. We're putting on the normal heart. The uh, Larry. Great Larry oh, Kramer AIDS yeah. play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they changed these two roles so that, like, smaller roles, but so that they were played by women. So uh, my, yeah, uh, another girl and I were in it. And I wanted to do this play, and I couldn't because I had to do this stupid job that was very inflexible, and I was painting, like, literally painting dorm rooms all day, and it was super boring. Yeah, but you had your dignity while you did it? Uh-huh, yeah, exactly, uh-huh. And you were still a woman. <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, I, I, my friends and I had decided to... Maybe go and see about getting jobs at, at the strip club out in the nearest uh, town where there was one. And so we did. We went out there. And then neither of my friends ended up doing it. But I was like, hell yeah. Like, this definitely beats uh, painting dorm rooms. So How so? Why? Oh, I mean, because I was making minimum wage. And I had to work very – like, and I just – so then I worked, like, two – I worked two nights a week out there. And it wasn't like – it was not – 
a lot of money at all, but it was as much as I was making in a whole, you know, 40 yeah. hour work week doing manual labor. So, and how did you feel about and it? I was like 19 at the time, mm -hmm. which would now make me uh, illegal in, in some places like New Orleans. Mm -hmm. It's now illegal mm -hmm. for people under age 21 to work at strip clubs. And this was in Ohio? The, well, I was in school in Ohio, but the uh, club was in West Virginia. Oh my gosh. Yeah. A strip club in West Virginia. Yeah. Oh, in Appalachia too, right? Yeah. You were, you were, yeah. yeah. You were, <laughs> so you were a stripper in a strip club in, in West Virginia. Yes. Uh-huh. When you were 19 Teenage, years old. Yes. yes. Well, now we have the answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is this is one of the first times I've talked about this uh, on that's, on air. <laughs> I, I warned you. That's what I do here. That's that's really cool and amazing. So, what was it? What did it feel like? I mean, I I thought it was a great experience. Um, I went. Yeah, I worked there that summer, and then I didn't during the school year. And then uh, a friend of mine, actually, who is still a really good friend of mine, went back with me the next summer, and we worked there. And by that point, it had this really awful uh, manager, this old dude who was just like. Argh gruff and just you're like your stereotypical sleaze pretty much uh but by the following summer they had kicked him out because everyone hated him and these two sisters who like had a chicken farm together in their spare time were managing the place so it was, the whole vibe was changed and huh. it, was, it was really great it was it was women run yes and that mattered uh it at was, least in this it was case a definitely yeah it was definitely a different more positive vibe there that summer mm -hmm. than it had been the yeah. summer before but it was yeah so that was kind of that was what started me involved and so i mean from then on i just sort of was very interested and followed like along and when i i mean and this was a long time ago at this point uh, i graduated college in 2004 so um but then w when i started I, and i'd written some freelance stuff uh, about you know various sex work issues but when i started at reason i really wanted to cover that just from a sort of you know sex worker rights standpoint but doing that you kind of couldn't escape um the whole human trafficking, sex trafficking, hysteria, hysteria and the criminal justice like uh, side of things, which is how I've really sort of gone over to write about that. Yeah. Because in between in between these college uh, stripping days and now writing at Reason, I also did a lot of uh, legal writing just on all sorts of issues. So I think that I've just had, I've had a lot of, I've had experience with all these different facets of this issue, which sort of I think combines in the way that I now approach it. What was your legal work? Uh, so my first my first job out of college was at a newspaper um, in my first journalism job was at a newspaper in Ohio. It was a financial and legal newspaper called mm -hmm. The Daily Reporter. So I just um, I read like every court case in Franklin County, Columbus, Ohio, and wrote up summaries of them. And I interviewed all the judges in town and uh, did profiles of all the appeals courts and all sorts of stuff for a year. You had a lot. So that was of sort of my crash course in like, and I'd write two articles a day on this stuff. So it was just sort of my crash course in learning about the law and how to write about it competently two articles a day yeah that's a lot this is daily news print yeah so. that's a grind so you were you were stripping you were writing about <laughs> the law you were a journalist already uh that's pretty impressive you had a lot of energy and you were a theater major right yeah what was that about what were you doing uh i i ended up being a playwriting and directing major so right out of uh gosh yeah why what was i mean what were you into uh i mean i always i've always loved theater and i yeah i I still love playwriting, screenwriting. I don't do it anymore because I don't have time, but I would like to again someday. So more the writing than the yeah. performing? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I do like performing, but definitely I'm more on the writing. I love writing and directing. Really? Theater, yeah. And so I, I, gotta, I was like, gotta have a couple plays in the Columbus, Ohio Fringe Festival. And later when I lived in Brooklyn, I gotta have to have some of my theater done just by like little places. So um, that was really fun. Like there's nothing like seeing people actually put in your words yeah. into, into life. I don't know. Have you thought about writing a play about sex work? No, uh -huh. I have not at okay. all. Okay, I won't explore that then, unless you <laughs> want to. So then... I just haven't thought about writing a play about anything in a long time, unfortunately. Yeah, because you've been so busy with this. Yeah. And so you've been doing this for like five years now. Yeah, I've been at Reason for almost exactly five years now. And you've been covering this beat predominantly for five years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I write, about, I write about other things too, but this is definitely yeah. the one that is the bulk of my yeah attention and and because that's not enough you also need needed to found a nonprofit uh, political what would you call it um, what political uh, organization yeah well what's it called feminists, feminists for, liberty. for liberty yeah so you're founding that with someone else uh, Kat Murdy mm -hmm. yes and what is it why are you doing this uh, we are both we met through. Um, this group called the Association of Libertarian Feminists, 
online. They uh, all three of them. Uh, yeah, well, so this was a group that was actually really sort of, inf- it was started in the 70s by Tony Nathan, who was, you know, the first person, the first woman to get an um, electoral vote as the VP candidate for the LPs. Mm. Um, Sharon Presley and Joan Kennedy Taylor, this amazing mm. writer. But they, it was, it, it really had a lot of momentum. But by this point, um, you know, two of them are dead and Sharon Presley is just sort of trying to do stuff on her own. And she, it, it hasn't, it hasn't really kept up with the times, you know, it doesn't have like a website it does, I don't, I don't even know if it does anymore. It doesn't have a social it, media presence that's very active and things like that. So um, Kat and I, and then we're also involved in this group called Ladies of Liberty Alliance, but that is, um, it's more about networking and it's just for women. And we were really like, there's a, there's not a group that is for, I mean, we think anybody can be feminist. So that is, that is a, you know, gender and sex neutral group that, mm. you know, um, and that also isn't about networking or anything, but is explicitly about ideas, libertarian feminist ideas. So, um, yeah, so we started this group to try and fill that. But what's role. the what's the argument? What's the critique of feminism? Why do you need to form this group? Why can't libertarian women just go join now? Well, so yeah, people are always meaning like, meaning join N O W National Organization. Okay, of women. yeah, I was like, <laughs> got it. Well, because you know most most of the pre- prevailing uh, feminist groups today and for the past however many decades have been very very uh, state centered and socialist center, but there's, you know, there's a huge like individualist feminist tradition going back to the sort of earliest feminist days. You know, there's always been this tension between individualist feminists or libertarian feminists and socialist feminists. And it's just, I think a strain that we have hardly seen any of lately. So, um, so is it, it's their ideas about economics that bothers you the most? Oh no. I mean, it's probably idea. It's, it's everything. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, I think that the most of, of modern feminism is just very centered on as soon as you identify a problem, like here's how we should pass a law. Here's how we should get the government involved. Right. Um, and just has no sort of awareness of, of the ways that those things backfire. Um, no like internal logic or consistency whatsoever. Also, you know, I find that I get along better with socialist feminists than with sort of mainstream Democrats oh, and yeah. mainstream. Because at least socialist feminists, you know, like, yeah, we tend to disagree on the economic stuff, but they are at least appreciative of, of sort of structural stuff in a way and, and criminal justice issues and civil liberties things. And they, they're they at least more willing to sort of, I don't know, I, I hate the kind of, you know, the Hillary Clinton, um, now Kamala Harris, the sort of uh, that sort of sloganeering feminism that really just sort of emphasizes symbolic things over actual changes and putting people in prison yeah and putting people in prison pretty much that's yeah yeah I and mean, bombing people and you know um the fancy academic term for them is carceral feminists yes i love that term i want to say carceral like all the time yeah. and people are always asking me what it means <laughs> and i know it's not a word that is like accessible and i should stop using it so much but it just like rolls off the tongue so well yeah carceral and it feminists. and it sounds so heavy and yeah. it's and it's so accurate though it is it because is because that is their approach is to use the state to correct the problems yeah. between men and women I always think of that, um, that I forget who tweeted it. I think it's, I think it's maple cocaine is the account, which just, you know, the little clap emoji and it's like uh-huh. hire more women prison guards with the little claps between each heart, <laughs> exactly. which I think sort of sums it up, you that's, know? Yeah. That's it. That's it. And, and border patrol guards and, right. you know, and Marines right. and all of the rest of it, air force pilots and senators. And we have, now we have a Senator who's also an air force pilot. Very proud of her for her service. I love she talked. She gave that really moving testimony about being raped in the military, and then and then during that talked about taking her her team, whatever her squadron, into combat. And I was like, no, you didn't. That wasn't combat. <laughs> that was bombing civilians, <laughs> uncontested. But I was completely with her on the rape. Um, so, uh, how did you? Were you? Did, were you identifying as a libertarian early on, and and if so, why or why not? Uh, yeah, I was not, when I was in college, I didn't, I didn't really know about it till right after college. I kind of, you know, I used to think in high school, maybe I was like a Democrat and then I decided I was too liberal for the Democrats because, you know, I didn't agree on back then things like, I mean, the foreign policy still, but like gay marriage was a big thing back then. Mm. And, and, um, so I, and I just didn't really pay attention to economic stuff at all back then. So I, yeah. Uh, and then I was. So you were more of a cultural radical, it sounds like. Is I guess. Fair to say? I guess, yeah. I mean, you were into all of yeah. it. Yeah. But I mean, you were doing a lot of Yeah, I mean, I was a hippie. I was, I was oh. definitely like a, sort of a hippie. Oh. But, I, but I also kind of hated the hippies too. I did because, I mean, this was also the time where I feel like there was a lot of people that were like going and protesting the like, uh, um, the, the, oh, the global the, trade thing. Oh, 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 Seattle. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, just, you know, like. In 1999, yes. This uh-huh. was just that sort of era, this. 
and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't tend to like them either. So yeah, I just felt like a misfit. Like I didn't have a political place. And I was a theater kid, so that was okay. Cause it was just like, whatever. I'm I was gonna like, say, you were also, you, know. in, you are also disqualified from being on the left because you were interested in fun. Yes, exactly. Right. And maybe that almost, that almost disqualified you from being a libertarian too, we should say. So the thing with libertarians and fun, here's their position on it. They don't want the state to stop you from having fun, but they're not so good at having it themselves. <laughs> Right? Some libertarians. And a lot of them are not going to approve of particular kinds of fun you have, but they won't make the state stop you from having fun. Right. Which is as it should be, I guess. Which we'll yeah. take, right, yeah. Liz? But yes. we don't, that's not exactly what we're about. <laughs> you and I have other interests here. I wonder if you and I, at least in part, are attracted to the sex worker movement um, because of that. Because it's it's about pleasure at the bottom of it, right? In a, in a way, and fun and sensuality and all these things that the political political people on the left and the right kind of don't talk about yeah right that makes sense yeah and i mean that's why i hate in a way what i do and i hate politics even though i'm obsessed with it because it's so arid and vacuous and it's it's in that way it's it's lacking sort of the pleasures of life right I mean, and so did you, did you find that when you started getting into politics that you were frustrated with these people about this or that it was? No, I mean, cause I'm also a huge dork. I don't know. I uh, really like, yeah, right. I, you were right. You were studying yeah, legal was, cases. All yeah, day. yeah. I was reading legal cases all day and loving it. I mean, that was kind of, oh, so yeah, to go back to, I went to, I went to an Institute for Humane uh, Studies seminar okay. in, here in DC. This is while I was taking in that Columbus, Coke Ohio money and living there. Yeah. And they, you know, introduced me and I was too fit libertarianism existing, classical liberalism existing. You know, I'd never taken an econ class in college or anything. Um, so it was like, wow, this is this is what I believe. This is what I've believed all along. And there's like a name for it and there's people. And, you know, they gave me a subscription to Reason Magazine. They gave me a bunch of books by, uh, they gave me a book by Jacob Solom and one by Gene Healy of Cato and stuff. So I'm totally born of like, you know what people critique the like Cosmo libertarianism too. I mean, my entire libertarianism is like born and raised in 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 the cosmo. Uh, oh, cosmotarianism. Yeah, the cosmotarian, the the DC professional libertarian circles a lot. But I mean, that was that was what made me realize it. And then I decided I wanted to come here and go to grad school in DC and like work in professional libertarianism. Hmm. Um, I thought I wanted to do PR. I went to grad school for one year and studied PR, and then I was like, no, going back to journalism. But. The good thing about when I was in grad school, I did also get to do a lot of like communications theory stuff and work on like copyright law stuff. And I got really into that. So I really kind of can wonk out on really dorky issues <laughs> like that. So you're perfect for the job. You've got, yes. all, you've got all the tools, in other words. Yeah. So then you so you came here and you've been living in D.C. and you actually like it here. I find that odd. Well, I lived here for three years and then I got out and I went okay. to Brooklyn for a few years ah. in New York because I... Um, yeah, I felt like DC was making me prematurely old back then. Mm. But then now that I am old, I'm like okay with it. <laughs> okay, I see. So you're retiring here. <laughs> it's a but, I mean, I actually really love it here. It was just, you know, it's it's definitely everybody gets here and is very striving. Yet yeah. and yeah, whereas I mean, it was. In New York, and I'm sure it's the same way in LA, like, you know, you can be involved with people who are doing all sorts of different things. You could have friends involved with many different things. Here, you can't. Like, everyone is doing pretty much one that's thing right. in some, you know, capacity or other. And not just that, it's a politics that's centered around the government for yes. obvious reasons, yes. right? And so they tend to, which is not in itself a bad right. thing, it's just that that's only one part of politics, right. right? And you and I and other people are interested in other parts of politics, which is one reason I think that reason should leave DC. Because reason is interested in other parts of politics. But I, yeah, well, that's a longer discussion yeah. we can have. But I would imagine that's frustrating here, though, for you. It was, I mean, yeah, I think I've gotten, I've gotten used to it and I found ways around it. But it was really refreshing, like when I first moved to New York and I had, yeah, I'd been here for three years and it was just, you know, I'm so used to seeing heritage interns and bow ties at everything and just to, I don't know, be around people like you said, who are doing politics in different ways. I mean, like I knew a lot of people in New York. I, I got, you know, very involved people doing like rooftop farm stuff and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And like underground farmers markets, we ended up, you know, going up against the, the city government because the New York Times wrote an article about this like underground market that I was, me and my friends were a part of. And, you know, then they were going to shut it down because people didn't have the right food permits and stuff. And it was actually really interesting too then to be talking to people about these issues and watching in real time as people started like, getting this burgeoning sense of libertarianism. Wow. These, you know, hipsters because they couldn't sell their raw vegan nut pate. So when were you in Brooklyn? 
2009 to uh, 2013. Okay, I had just left. Some, yeah. I was just, I was living there just I was before then. Yeah, a little bit of that time too. So but so in Brooklyn, in, you know, famous among the hipster part of Brooklyn, uh, the Park Slope Food Co op is well known. And for being, well, a horrible place for a lot of us. But, And then there's there's a farmer's market at the Grand Central Market in that part of Brooklyn every Saturday. But, you know, and everybody loves those things. So you had an underground? I mean. Illegal farmer's market? So it was in, in a, Brooklyn? It was in a church basement. So that makes it literally underground. And yes, I mean, it wasn't, it didn't have like. It does not make it holy anything. though. It does so, not make uh, it right, young lady. <laughs> this was like the coolest, uh, coolest, I think it was a Methodist church. Is that a pastor? It's like the coolest pastor I've so ever met. Yeah. You guys are selling like unlicensed, unregulated I food. I mean, some people were actually had, were small businesses that had, you know, sold all over at different farmer's markets and had their papers. But yeah, there was also definitely like my roommates and I made weird nut pâtés, raw nut pâtés in our kitchen and kombucha and beer and, and sold it there. And there were a lot of people like us. Who how, were just, like, how, many, stuff. how many casualties were there? None. Oh, okay. None. Good. <laughs> well, I thought if, if the um, state of New York did not license something, it would kill you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I think that, that's what we were told. That's what I've been that's told. That's what we were told. Yeah. And that's certainly what I've always assumed. So you came down here, you got older, you settled into your normal job yes. of writing about sex work. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> working, working for the man now, clearly. Prostitutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow. I didn't know that's such a complicated career you had. <laughs> and you hadn't even turned 30 by that point, right? <laughs> so let's talk about sex work. Let's get into this. Let's talk about the history. I, I would imagine there's probably no one. Maggie McNeil certainly would be maybe the only other person who, could, who knows the history as well as you do. But let's talk about the last several years of this movement and how it's changed and how the law has changed. And, and also I'm interested in what you're, I, I'm constantly telling Maggie, you know, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to get legalization or, de- or decrim uh, in our lifetimes. She's always like skeptical, but I'd like to get your take on that. But first, yeah, let's just talk about, you're, you're watching this thing unfold. You know, the sex worker movement, there's always been one, but it's been tiny and almost completely obscure until the last couple of years when it's actually, there was a major uh, article in the New York Times Magazine featuring Maggie and other, other people too. And it's just gotten, finally, it's not major victories, but the media at least is starting to pay attention. So that's a big change while you've been working on this and you've seen this. So why don't you just talk about sort of what it was like five years ago and then how it's evolved over the time. Yeah, I guess I don't really, I haven't really thought about it as not having been there five years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think I've, yeah, I, so I don't know that I've, I feel like there's been that arc. Sorry, I'm pausing now. That's no, okay. But I do, you but, see it but you're right. There, I think that there might, that there might be. I just, I hadn't really thought about it. I think that there's always like this sort of coverage in the news, but you're right. Like, I think it was very much more sensationalist until recently. Um, I'm talking about the movement. Right, right. To Instead de- of, right, to, to, to decriminalize. Is actually getting, because yeah. yeah, I guess I'm trying to think, because there's always these stories about sex workers, but it was never, it was never very much positioning them in a political light that was positive, I guess. Liz, yeah. this is why you deserve the um, fucking but, Pulitzer Prize. I'm no, trying to explain this to I you. Think, uh, You're the reason for this. No, 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 no. This is definitely, I think this <laughs> is definitely just the product of the fact that, I mean, social media, like Twitter. Sex workers have been able to speak for themselves like never before on Twitter, you know? I mean, I think it's so easy because you see it constantly still happening yeah, to this day. Yeah. You can have swarms of hundreds of sex workers yes. telling some prohibitionist, you know, like, no, actually, here's what our lives are like. Here's this. And that person will still try to say, oh, no, you guys are just like a representative, not a representative. You're just mo- you're a minority. You're the, you know, but most 99% of, you know, people doing sex work are like this. But it's a lot harder for them to say that. I mean, they are still saying it, but it's a lot harder for people to believe that when you can see that, like, no, you can just see all of these people talking for themselves in mass for the first time. So I think that's what's made all the difference. I am not giving you credit I know. for the sex I know. worker movement. I know. I'm just, yeah. But I am totally giving you credit for giving it some aura of legitimacy um, because the reason has some legitimacy. I mean, it's. <laughs> See, it's, I'm also like, everyone just always is like, reason. We'll, yeah. we'll read about that when it's somewhere. I mean, no, well, we, we definitely have a lot of legitimacy. We, There's also just a lot of people that you, will try to dismiss stuff that I write on this issue because of that, which is, it's just kind of great actually. Cause then there are enough people who will just swoop in and be like, screw you. Like if you're not going to read them on this, then because yeah. of you think some bias about libertarians, then 
Well, your readership has yeah. grown, hasn't it? Yours personally over the last several yeah. years? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. You're winning. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, you're winning. Seriously. So the the sex workers, of course, are primarily responsible for yes. the movement that they themselves yes. have built. But you then have reported on it to people who w- would be otherwise indifferent or hostile yeah. to it from a position of some authority here in Washington, D.C. from this think tank and magazine and website, right? Yes. That is featured. You guys are on cable news networks every single night, pretty much. You're on, you know, all sorts of media. You are an established, legitimate media outlet. I think it, I think it helps too that, you know, we were talking about the whole like pleasure uh, aspect of this, but libertarians have historically always sort of emphasized that or emphasized the, the, you know, it's, it's my body. People should consenting adults should be able to do what they want, which like, you know, I 100% agree with all of that. But I think that I do tend to talk about it much more from a, a, like a harm reduction standpoint and stuff like that, which I think is what this moment right now needs Hmm. in terms of where we are, like in our, in our cultural politics, you know, I just feel like as much as I agree with a lot of the other arguments, they just don't cut it, especially in the face of people always trying to shove this human trafficking narrative down the thing. So I feel like, you know, yeah, just really focusing on the, not not even the rights so much in a like, we have the right to do this because our body's our choice, but in the like, we have a right to fucking survive, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that that's, yeah. That's, I think, where, and I really think that I've shifted sort of much more in that direction over the past five years as I've been doing it because... You're talking about harm reduction? What yeah. Do you, what do just, you mean by that? Um, just, you know, when people ask you about why prostitution should be decriminalized, I mean, my fundamental, my, my go-to reasons are always about, you know, because it will keep both people who are, doing this by choice and people who are even being victimized and, you know, exploited, it will still keep them safer. It'll make their lives better. It'll make them less likely to, you know, experience violence and be stuck in exploitative situations and things like that. Why is that? Um, all the reasons, <laughs> because, you know, because then under, under a decriminalized system, people can actually go to police and know that they'll be taken seriously and not face arrest. Other, their clients and people in their communities would be the, you know, the most apt to be able to report that stuff and see stuff if there is going wrong could report it. Um, you can work in pairs, you can work in systems with security, you can work in brothels, you can work in any sort of ways that, you know, allow for various protections. You can screen people. You'd have clients that weren't afraid to show their real IDs and things like that in order to, to be screened. I mean, just, just the possibilities in our decriminalized system for, for life being safer, just, yeah, immense. They can provide for their own security instead of depending on criminals known as pimps. Right. Right. And that's what prostitutes used to do in the 19th century before they cracked on on the brothels they tended to own the brothels themselves and provided their own security often hiring police officers actually to provide security in those old those old brothels that was under basically a decrim system i mean it was criminalized but it was unenforced especially in the west right and so that's kind of i think what we would go back to i could see that um certainly it's happening in europe already where there's been decrim and in new zealand so I, I like it a lot. I mean, of course, that's where I, my position is, too. Um, I, uh, it's, gosh, it's hard, though. It's hard. I, I have talked to, when I used to teach normie in normie colleges as a college professor for many, many years, I would, I would say to my students, you know, what if I brought in guest speakers this week? And one of them was a cashier at CVS, and she was a woman. How would you think about her? What would you, what would you feel about her? And we talk about it and this and that, you know, might feel bad that she makes minimum wage and has a bad job, but otherwise it's fine. I said, well, what if, what if I brought in another guest speaker who made five times more money and said that she liked her job or at least liked it more than working at CVS, but was what we call a prostitute. And I could just feel sort of like this almost is this visceral kind of instinctive negative reaction. I don't know exactly what was in their heads, but I could just, I could tell when they said this, you know, they just... There's something, this deep, there's like a, a taint, right, to, the, to sex work um, that is so, it's so deep and they can't, can't get over it. And they see those women especially as being fundamentally uh, degraded, I guess. And it's, yeah, and I think one of the things that's unfortunate too because under, under you know, because there's so much stigma and the law, you don't have people just talking about their experiences with sex work as much as they, you know, could be. Because I know so many people who, who like me, like, did a little bit like of this in co- like strip clubs in college or did this or that, you know, and just has dabbled, has like done part time things. Like I know so many young women who have done just at various points in their lives when they needed money, like a little bit of this or that. And like, it's not a big it's like not a big thing. It's like not a thing that defines them at all. It's not a thing that has really influenced much of their lives at all. Like it, it really is, I think, a thing that people come in and out of very 
absolutely. But because you only hear about these certain kinds of things are, are the stories that, yeah, that make the media and stuff. And I think that that, yeah, just really skews people. You don't, you don't think so much that it can be just a thing that people like sometimes do, like having a summer job anywhere else, you know? So what did you, what have you seen though? Have you seen a change in people's minds in DC over the last several years? I mean, you said that I think earlier, but I mean, how many and what kinds of people or what, what? I don't know. I think that there's been a change somewhat because I think Americans actually, though, even, as much as there is a stigma, Americans do tend to support some form of some form of decrim or legalization of sex work, right? Do they? I mean, yeah. If you talk, if you look at polls, and it depends, and it's changed somewhat over the past two decades, but especially if you're talking the '90s, early 2000s, before some of this trafficking hysteria hit, because most people are like, they'll be like, you know, oh, I want there to be not on not on my street, you know, or I want to be behind closed doors, but. It's the same sort of thing with gay marriage, even, I think, whereas, you know, even as attitudes were as, as American liberalized, it was kind of like you couldn't really justify why it was this thing. We don't have such a strong moral hold on it anymore. So I think generally most people in America now would be OK with it if you could get past this idea that legalized or decriminalized prostitution led to more sex trafficking and human trafficking. And the only reason you can't is because there's been a very, very, very concerted effort, as you know, like over the past two decades to intertwine all of that and conflate that. And that's, I think, been very deliberate because they knew people wouldn't wouldn't go for, you know, this whole like, let's attack prostitution just head on or let's attack all sex work, you know, strip clubs, porn, whatever, head on. They need to sort of couch that authoritarian and moral impulse in, in something else. And that's <clears throat> why we see, yeah. Right. So let's talk about New Zealand for mm-hmm. a second. And which has a decriminalization regime, essentially, I think, right? What has been the outcome there? Um, that there've just there have been no more. I think they said there's no more evidence of more sex trafficking, you know, forced or fraud or anything mm. happening, and they have had more sex workers come forward about violence they've experienced from clients and things. Which is not to say that they think that there's been an increase of it, just that there's been more people who have been like, I felt comfortable coming forward about, right. you know, being attacked, which is which is good because unfortunately, yeah. Well, it's interesting if we get decriminalization, prostitutes have a couple of they can go in two directions. They can go in the carceral route, which is one you've already spelled out, which is appealing to the state for protection. You can call the cops on uh, on a John who's violent, right? right? Or the other alter- alternative, which we laid out too, is to self-organize right. and provide their own right. security and support, right? So what's been going on in New Zealand? Have you seen any of that, by the way? Have you seen like, I, self-organization among self- sex workers? I don't actually know. I don't know a okay. lot about, what, yeah. What about, about what's Europe? Going on in New Zealand. Similar things in Europe, like in Germany, there's these supposed mega brothels there. And, I mean, what's there's mostly decriminalization in parts of Europe. I think some of, of the really, indes- in, um, like in India, there's a lot of sex worker collectives, yeah. which is really interesting. Oh, yeah. And I think maybe in South Africa. Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's funny because, yeah, we don't think of that. But actually, some of the, you know, some of areas where people I think wouldn't think of it because they think of like oh those are very poor countries they must be exploited you actually see that the sex worker I mean I think they've got like a pension system sort of set up through the government in India there's some sort of thing where they can be you know they can get the same sort of whatever benefits that other people get so it's yeah it's interesting to see like actually no like there are there are so many different models how we can do this I always like to try and just stress to people too when they're like oh it should be legalized so people can get testing or whatever you know it's like it should be decriminalized so that there's no, you don't get arrested for doing this between consenting adults whatsoever. Then if there wants to be, I feel like, additional systems where like you could go through the state sex worker licensing program and work in a you know, state sanctioned brothel if you wanted to. And that way, you know, some clients would feel more safe doing that and some workers would feel more safe doing that. Like, great. Like, I think that's great as, a, as an extra voluntary step, but like, we can't have that be the only thing that's legal because then, you know, you just repeat all the harms of, of a black market system. Right. Yeah. And then we have the Swedish model, which is now being pushed pretty hard, especially yeah. by Democrats are yeah. actually taking this it's, up now. Yeah. Right? So Kamala talk, Harris has kind of been on the Swedish model thing. And just to, I mean, for people, some people know this, yeah. but a lot of people don't just explain what that is. And, Basically uh, arresting people for paying for sex, but not for selling sex. Right. But it, that, that's how they'll sell it. You know, they'll say like, well, like the sex workers themselves aren't arrested, just the Johns and the pimps and stuff. But um, in effect, usually like in, in, some of these Norwegian countries and, and even I think like England has some sort of model like kind of like this. Um, it's, it's like only very specific circumstances. Like if you're working in this sort of place on these sorts of hours, but you can't advertise, you can't work with another person or whatever, then it's still illegal. So in effect, they still just end up arresting sex workers for right. stuff all the time. But yeah. they pretend like it's more compassionate because 
it, I think, stops seeming very feminist and PC to be like, we're going to lock up these women. I, I mean, the exchange is still illegal. Right. The exchange just, that yeah, they depend the on is still illegal. The whole thing is so stupid. It's right. really stupid. They just don't lock up the sex workers, but they right. make but they make their profession illegal. Illegal. Yeah. Right. So I mean, it's, they come, still do raids so they can arrest their clients. You know. I mean, it's I suppose just, it's. I guess it's an improvement. I suppose, but not much of one, right? For at least yeah. for sex workers. Yeah. Seems like, and certainly not for Johns. Yeah. And why on earth do we need to punish Johns? I need to know this. I need to know why we need to punish clients of sex workers and that's what that's what harris we so keeps saying. desperately need to punish that's them as harris a society keeps saying, even yeah. though she keeps trying to claim that she's <clears throat> for decrim now but then she's like we need to really go after the johns and you're like that okay hey you're not for decrim if you still think you need to arrest half of the party <laughs> like <laughs> to this you know um but yeah no i don't it's a very strange it's, it's such a patronizing and anti-feminist view too i mean because we're not talking we need to go after the people who are exploiting like yes everyone agrees like you shouldn't be able to, you know, use force and fraud and coercion or be, you know, in, involved in this. But we're just talking about paying another willing adult for sexual services and saying, oh, but like the woman has no agency here. She has no culpability or agency. So therefore, the man is just automatically guilty. Because when we talk about, yeah, it's just it's weird. I you think know, it's so strange that they try to portray that as the feminist viewpoint. Yeah. You know, I, I just had a, a weird flash. I don't know if this makes any sense to you at all, but I I. I I think I'm keep going back to your, your background, actually. And you told me, I think, before we started recording about what your parents did for a living. And you said your dad was an electrician. Yes. And your mother worked in various jobs. Yes. All of which Marxists would call work, working class jobs, yes, right? Yes, definitely. And in Ohio, right? And so I'm thinking sort of this was at the height of the meth epidemic and right when op- the opioid crisis starts taking off down around there. So this is really working class America that yes. you come from, right? Yeah. And... Does that, do you think that has anything to do with your trajectory that you come from a different class background from, than from a lot of other people in this town? Oh, 100%. And I've yeah. got like a little bit of a Holden Caulfield uh, thought of me about, about it. Let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about this. So wh- how does that come? What do you mean you have a Holden Caulfield about you? Uh, I, mean, I, I, think just, I, I think I know, but go ahead. Yeah, I just there's so many people in this city who don't even sort of realize um, how much privilege that they've had and I, I use that term you know I don't mean in the sort of uh, you know like check your privilege but just I'm not it's not anything bad but just so many people especially the like liberal journalists who mm-hmm. really just don't but they've you know been raised in in certain yes um, sorts of families gone to certain sorts of schools sometimes even starting in high school these fancy schools that groom them for these certain colleges and internships I mean when I got here and just realized that like almost everybody in DC who is working in journalism even in these like low level you know liberal publication jobs um but they'd been through so many internships and it was like I had to work in the summer I don't know it was I didn't ever actually really think that I had been at all disadvantaged not disadvantaged but I I didn't realize these things until I got to DC after college and was just something like oh wow some people have been preparing for some certain thing and groomed into it their whole and it's really weird and um yeah I don't know I guess one of the things you hear a lot too is this um criticism of, of the Koch networks, which do a lot of summer seminars for people from around the country and bring you here to learn about. Like you. Yeah, like me. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, um, I know so many people, though, who have come to work here at Reason or at other libertarian organizations in D.C. doing things like like I'm doing, like sex worker rights stuff, doing criminal justice reform, doing these very, you know, these those sorts of topics who got to come here because we were exposed through this network that let us you know, that paid for us to do a thing, but we wouldn't have been able other to always do. And I think that the Coke programs enable a lot of that, like people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford these sorts of things. And yeah, it kind of makes me mad when you have these people who are just sort of born into this culture and, you know, this East Coast academic culture and internship culture and publishing culture that it's, they they don't appreciate that some people needed other, you know, ways to enter that they grew up they grew up in bethesda or the upper west side or in cambridge and they went to prep schools yeah. and, and they went to ivy league schools it's amazing how much of the liberal journalist class here that really does describe i mean liberal and conservative but, that, that, yeah, that, that just that, describes that, that describes like it's, it's amazing it's a huge amount massive proportion of the people who do this stuff professionally yeah. had exactly those childhoods yeah, yeah. one of those yeah they came from those places it's in, in remarkable the american Wow, I'm going to use a term I have not used since I was officially a Marxist. The American ruling class is very small, very small, yes. and and has and lives in the same neighborhoods. There's about three neighborhoods that they all live in, 
and they go to the same schools, same colleges, and most of them, not all, but most of them want the same jobs. Yeah. And most of them get those jobs. Yes. And most of them are all around us, which is why I don't understand why you want to live here and why reason is here. And I mean, like, so I, I feel very lucky. Like, I still, I'm a huge <laughs> family in Ohio. Um, and I have, you know, family in Ohio and Kentucky is where I'm from. And I'm very close to them and I see them a lot still. And I feel like it's good to, yeah, be not just of, of this place. So you mentioned Sharon Presley. Yes. Earlier. Sharon doesn't like me. And because, and this was her words, she, she, I think she called me a libertine as opposed to a libertine. She, she drew a dis- distinction between libertines and libertarians, the former being not good and the latter being good. And to which I say, right on, I'm a libertine. Thank you very much. You're a libertine. I don't know. I, I, okay. Are you? Not, not really. You drink LaCroix. I do. I do. <laughs> but you drink other things too. You, you tweet a lot about drinking. I do. I like, I That's like good. red wine. That's good. I like the red wine. See I like I'm the saying? marijuana. I'm kind of a prude though. You, and I'm kind you, of, you know, you like, like I said, a dork. You, you like the weed? So, yes. Lifetime or recently? Uh, about 10 years ago. Yeah. It was when I was, yeah, when I was living in New York and they had the weed delivery services there, you know, where they can, it was the first time where I realized that there were different kinds of weed, really, instead of just like whatever shitty weed someone was like, and I was always like, eh, because I didn't really like it that much in college or anything, but yeah, they'd be like, here's a sativa, here's an indica, this is, and I was like, what? Yeah. When I got to experiment with it like that and and find out exactly what worked for me, that opened up the whole thing for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I used exactly. to just get really paranoid and anxious all the time. And I was like, and I don't like, like, mm. I don't like the kind that slow you down at all. So, mm. oh, so you want the sativa then? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm an indica guy. I need to be uh, sedated <laughs> heavily every single night because my life is so terrible. See, this is why I don't think I'm a, I'm a libertine. <laughs> I'm a little too type A. Like, I am a little bit. Well, you work really hard and you're very busy. Yeah. But then you party a lot. Yeah. Seems like. Yeah, that's true. That's right? true. Yes. And you enjoy yourself yes. after work. Yes. And your work is about. I mean, DC is very much a town where, yeah, there's always there's always a party happening. Oh yeah, but lame ones. I mean, you, you go can to be, you can make them fun though. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, oh, but so I think you, you definitely have a libertine at least streak. Yes, in you, I, okay, sure. right, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I want to know about your family though. Were they these working class people in Ohio and Kentucky? What were their attitudes about sexuality? And I want to know, did you ever tell them any of them that you stripped? <laughs> Mom and Dad, I hope you're not listening to this podcast. Uh, I have not. I mean, I've told my I've told my sister and some of my cousins and stuff. Yeah, my parents do not do not know that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so long ago now, like, which is actually the only reason I would never really talk about it because I didn't want them to know. Not that I thought they would. Uh, yeah, but it's, well, it's like so long ago now that it's whatever. Why didn't you tell them? Ah, um, uh, I mean, I don't think they would have. I don't think they would have been huge fans of that idea. This is. I grew up. Uh, I mean, I grew up in a very Catholic family. I went to ten years of Catholic school. Oh, you're a Catholic um, yeah, girl. Why yeah. didn't you say so? Yeah, now that's we probably understand. all we need to know. Yeah, about that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Now we got the key. <laughs> yeah. So they're Catholics. Okay. What kind? My, of- well, my my mom's side of the family is Catholic. Yeah, my mom was raised Catholic. My dad actually didn't. He converted in about six or seven years ago um, only because you know if you're a Catholic and you want to if you want to convert and you have to do this whole classes and it's a really long process but we had this priest who was leaving and he was like to my dad like I see you here every Sunday for like 10 years now you know what you want to make all three of your sacraments in one day and get it all over with three for one just do it and he's like all right so the priest let him kind of skip the, the rules and did you go to Catholic school yeah grade school and uh, two years of high school I went to two years of public high school at the end and uh. it was the best decision ever but this is, um, and this is, you know, I know we're just talking about being from a working class family and it sort of doesn't sound like it, but uh, this is, Cincinnati, Ohio is full of Catholic schools and it's a very much um, oh, yeah. across the board sort oh, no. of thing. Catholic it's not schools... like they're just like fancy. No, 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 no. Mostly Catholic schools educate working class people. That's what the Catholic church has been about for hundreds of years. That's what they do. Whether you like it or not, that's what yeah. they do. Um, but so that's okay. This all makes sense to me now. <laughs> you know why? Because Catholics have fun. Yeah, Catholics do have fun. Yeah. They drink. Yeah. Right. Formally, they yes. drink. It's yes. part it's oh, part yes. it's part of the yeah. Yeah. And they also don't really care about the rules as much as I feel like other religions. Like they have the rules and they like formally acknowledge them, but they don't really care Boom. that much, you know, they make exceptions a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. They're really loud about their rules. Yeah. But they're very loose about enforcing them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now you can ask, the, the obvious thing is, you, you know, the priests and the children, that's the obvious uh, <laughs> hypocrisy. But for me, I think what's more important is there is, I think, they're so bad at, at sort of getting people to believe this stuff. They just hit, <laughs> they, they, they instead just try to hit you until you stop it, right? And then also, but like, we're fun. Like, yeah, like we're going to threaten you. And then also we're going to like have a lot of beer and fish. And then like, maybe one of those things will make you stay. Yeah. <laughs> beer and fish? <laughs> uh, the fish fries. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Yeah, no. So I, when they would always, when they'd serve beer at the church was during the Friday fish fries and Lent, so. <laughs> and, and their churches are beautiful. Yes, yeah. The, the robes of the priests are beautiful. The music is gorgeous. I like the incense. Yeah, the incense is nice. It's a sensual religion. Yeah. Very much. One could call it a libertine religion. <laughs> In fact, Protestants have called it a libertine religion. So it makes sense to me. Now, yeah, what? so my dad's side of the family was was Baptist, and they, oh. they were the Kentucky relatives, and we'd go down there to visit, and they, like... That's a different I, story. One time, the whole, like, the ba- the preacher just had, like, a whole mass about how Catholics were terrible as we sat there in the, in the second row or something. So. That's why we tried to drum you people out of this country <laughs> in the 1920s. We didn't do a good job of it. But that's, you know, that the Ku Klux Klan, do you know this, in Ohio in, in the 1920s, that's what they were primarily interested in doing, was getting rid of the Catholics. I did not know that. that it was your people they were trying to get rid of. They hated Fair. the Catholics more than anyone. Because the Catholics owned all the jazz clubs. The Catholics were the Jews and the Italians who were having sex with their nice little white daughters. And, you know, a lot of their daughters, the Catholic daughters would go and, like, become prostitutes and sex workers and stuff, Oh, yeah, I have this aunt that there's, like, a legend about. (laughs) What? Aunt Aunt Alvera. She went off to New York, and and then then there's just, like, a wink. What? (laughs) Excuse me? Wait. She was one of, like, 14 good Catholic girls, but, yeah. What's her name? Alvera. Alvera, Aunt yeah. Alvera, and she went to. I never. I mean, this was like my my great grandma's sister, so I don't I don't know of this, but there's family lore that she just quote went to New York. She went off to period, New York. yeah, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, wink. And never <laughs> like, and never came back. Yes. <laughs> oh no, kidding! You need to find her. I yeah, she's not alive anymore. She actually did. Oh. I, I I was I was very interested in trying to figure this out, but did you find anything out? No, nothing. Nothing. Oh damn. Nothing. But it's, it's, it seems to be running in your blood a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-causal. Now, I, I came into this building having no idea why you're interested in sex work. And now I have about 10 reasons. <laughs> so it's good. We've done a lot of work here. So your parents were... This has been like, has been like a therapy session here. <laughs> that's what we do here. That's what we do here. Yeah. Do you feel better or worse? <laughs> or just more self... You have more self-knowledge. This is a more fun than I've had on a podcast in a long time. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah that's, we've got to stop. Let's get back to policy. <laughs> no more fun. Yeah, no, uh, it's... Uh, so so they're, they're sound, they sound like they're not going to punish you too terribly when they hear this podcast. I'm not going to share this podcast Oh, I'm sending them. it right to them. <laughs> <laughs> I got married last summer, though, and my mom did stand up during her speech, and she said something like, you know, we used to think she was going to be a nun. Now she writes about sex workers, but my mom's kind of babbly when she talks, so it's just like my sister and I are just dying because we're just like, I think she just said the words nun and sex like 10 times over and over again. So, so. You're, wait a minute, your mom, your mom thought you were going to be a nun? Yeah. It was because I loved getting up and giving readings in front of people, but it's like, turned out I just like being in front of people and talking. <laughs> it wasn't so much the religion part as the... I don't, know about, stage. I don't know about this. Nuns do readings? What is this? What do nuns do? Uh, I mean, Catholic Mass, you would get up, like, as in grade school, you know, you'd get up and read oh, yeah. a Bible reading in front of you. There's people. a lot of performance. I'd always volunteer to do it, because, yeah. It's a very performative religion, yes. too. Another. And my mom was like, oh, look how much she loves God. Like, she always wants to get up there and do these readings. I was like, well, no, just likes being in front of people. So basically, you're just a Catholic. That's, that explains <laughs> everything. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we got Nick, uh, Nick Gillespie, Robbie Suave. There's a bunch of us Catholic school, uh, products of Catholic school in, at Reason Magazine. <laughs> I don't know what that says exactly, but. Um, it's really true, <laughs> at least in my experience, about women who grew up in the church are just, they're just different about sex than women who grew up in Protestant churches. I mean, in my experience, it's. Definitely more libertine on the Catholic side. Oh, not so. Not I'm like the the wild one in my family, though. Mm. Uh, my family is they're they're pretty conservative across the board. And okay. I mean, I'm not talking about politics right now, but you know, yeah. But your mom. So your, is your mom? A, how did she feel about your job? Now you said she was somewhat disappointed. She said this thing publicly <laughs> about you. She was gonna you were gonna she be was, a nun. She was kidding. Yeah. And now you, she but, was kidding. She's, but the she's fact happy. that she kids about yeah. it is good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. 
And so what is, yeah, what is she? Oh, what do your parents think about sex work? Should they, do they think it's Liz Brown? No, have they, you, they have you been, convinced your parents? Oh, 100%. <gasps> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. Um, and I think, so this is good. This is going to sound super cheesy, but I do tell, you know, I think when I very first started writing about this, my mom was kind of like, why do you, you know, but why, you know, why, why I write about this? I'm like, because, I mean, one of the reasons that I do like writing about this too is just because like nobody else is doing this. Nobody, I, I don't mean like, cause I want to break new, but, but because somebody fucking needs to, you know, like nobody is actually being honest and telling, telling stories about what's happening to all of these people that are involved in all these different aspects of the, the crackdown on prostitution. And it's sad and it's ruining people's lives. And so many people are just afraid to touch it. And my mom was, and dad were always the people who made us like, made us like hang out with the weird neighbor kids we didn't like and bring them to parties and like made us, you know, made us be nice to everybody, even when we didn't want to at the threat of being grounded. But so um, I feel like that, hmm. you know, was very, so that's what I kind of, I brought that up to her mom and I was like, you know, you kind of raised me to always be like, always stick up for people that other people aren't. And that, this sounds very much like a savior mentality, you know, and I don't mean it like that, but I just do think that I'm drawn to hmm. being able to stick up for people that, and write the truths about yeah, stories that other people aren't. So you just you just touched on something that's really been vexing me lately because I I am a huge critic of the savior mentality, yeah. right? And I, I I like to use that epithet, you know, the yeah. savior mentality and white savior. I like to throw that around a lot. Guess who's a fucking white savior? Me. <laughs> I especially recently have been noticing myself taking on responsibility for people who are not in my family and not even really my friends. And it's like, I, I'm seeing it coming out of me right now. And I don't know exactly why now, but I, I now recognize that it's, it's been inside of me this whole time as I've been critiquing it from outside, right? Or in the outside. And it's been bad for me. That's the good news. I don't feel better. I feel worse. And so I think I'm going to give it up. That's good. Saving people. That's good. Do you, do you feel better? I don't, well, I don't think I, I don't, I'm having this, yeah, the, I realized the way I was describing it sounded like I meant like that. Well, we are, I mean, but I mean, I don't think of it, I guess I just mean, you are, we are telling truths so telling truths about things that other people are telling. No, but you're trying about. to, you're trying to achieve something decriminalization, yeah. Yeah. which will you think, and I think will yeah. help a, a lot of people in a big way. Not us though. Yeah. It'll help other people. Yeah. Right. We're doing this for other people. That's a very Christian thing to do. And it, now it makes perfect sense why you have this inside <laughs> of you. I think for me, I, I come from a different Christian church. Yeah. The, the church, the Christian church known as socialism, <laughs> where I was taught very much the same thing you were taught, just with different words. Yeah. Go help your neighbor. Yeah. Take care of your brother. Be your brother's keeper. Be your sister's keeper. All of that. Same exact morality. And I don't, it's weird. It's like I am convinced decriminalization is great and will be great for those people. It will do nothing for me because I am neither a sex worker nor a client of sex workers and never have been. Which again, it's like there's the only way I can explain why I care so much is this savior mentality inside okay, of me. Okay, hold on. Well, so here, let me help you. Yeah, let me please. put it back in a, a selfish way for you, all please. right? Yeah. Because the same principles that are, you know, driving the criminalization of sex work and mm -hmm. driving this, you know, extended panic about sex trafficking that's surrounding it is not just harming sex workers and their clients because under the guise of doing that, police are doing all the stuff like, you know, building new spyware for like, you know, facial recognition programs to look at all of us and like, you know, passing all these laws that then end up curtailing all of our civil liberties. So I think that the, the crackdown on this is sort of making everybody less free. Like FOSTA, I mean, you know, we've got all these websites now who are afraid to do in any sort of sex content. It's gonna affect, you know, personal ads and kink communities and things like that. So there are selfish reasons why you should care about this. Cool. And you cannot feel like a white savior. Well done. <laughs> I like that. Let's unpack a little of that, though. So you you just got back from Phoenix. Yes. Where you uh, were on a panel with the guys from Backpage. Yes. Talk about that. That's huge. Uh, yeah, they are not allowed to leave Maricopa County without explicit permission and blah, blah, blah. They have ankle monitors keeping in there. But we do this uh, Reason Conference at different places around the country once a year. And it, this year just happened to be in Phoenix. So when we found that out, we were like, oh, let's see if they would do an interview with us. And they did. And um, 
So explain the Backpage case for those who don't know this. Yeah, so the the Backpage, uh, the people who founded it and some of the people who had worked there were arrested last April, almost a year ago now, um, on charges of money laundering and conspiracy to facilitate prostitution. And uh, their trial is not until April 20, or sorry, until January 2020 at least. Uh, so because that was on, the government said they didn't want to, they weren't be ready till then, even though they arrested them last year. So they've got some time and they've been sort of uh, fighting over everything in the meantime. The government's been trying to seize assets from everybody and involved and things like that. Do we, and we don't know, do we know what the prosecutors want? Uh, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that they want them to bleed out. Yeah. They've been, they tried to disqualify their lawyers. Um, by, now they're trying to say that the funds they set aside for their lawyers are, they can't use the money they set in them. And they've just been, there's just been like one step after another um, where they've been doing things that are sort of unusual even for federal cases like this. So. so here's the thing. So that trial is next year, right? Yeah. So they have a long time. Yeah. Now I am serious about this. Um, I think your work will have a lot to do with whether, with how, with the outcome of that trial. I really mean this. And I mean this about everybody who's doing yeah. this work, but you're the most prominent. So I think, you know, the more we change the discourse, the conversation, right. the norms around this, the more likely it is that they'll get off. Right. The, and the well, more likely like, it is that other people like them will get yeah. off too. So they didn't want to, I mean, yeah. So I interviewed them over the summer for a, for an article um, at Reason. Oh. Read it at Reason.com. It's a big profile of them because, you know, they were like in the newspaper industry for like four decades before they launched Backpage. So it's, it's some of that stuff too. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've been, you know, covering this and covering their case, but they hadn't talked in front of people about it since they've been arrested. And they were kind of um, hesitant too, especially because their lawyers were like, do not do this. But uh, I think... They said they ended up glad that they did it. And I think it was really good for them to tell it in front of the Reason audience. I mean, it was only about 100 people, but still just, you know, I think hearing them talk about it in person actually just goes a long way to helping change. You guys going to release the video? I think so. Yeah, I think that there's going to be video. really, really should. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to help them a lot. Uh, yeah. If the national if the national conversation goes the way of marijuana, right, they're they're going to walk eventually, if not now. They're going to get out of prison very well, it's soon. Just, everyone thinks that there's like, you know, they're being charged for sex trafficking. But, you know, again, it's it's f- facilitating prostitution. Everyone thinks that they were arrested under FOSTA and that. But FOSTA actually wasn't law yet. It was became law right after they um, were arrested. So, I mean, it's funny because they've just gotten them on the same charges that they've been getting people on like brothels or websites that, you know, had ads for prostitution going back into the 90s and 80s. And it's the same charges that they've been applying just against that. So it's just funny because they try to make it into this whole like, oh, no, they're this big, new, scary thing. And it's like even under your own charges, your own, you know, framework, you're still just Mm -hmm. same thing you always do. I I recently talked to the director of operations for a major hospital in Southern California. And he found out what I do, that I was interested in politics. And he said to me, the first thing he asked me was, what do you think about this human trafficking crisis? And I said, wow, why are you asking me? He said, well, because we've been doing a lot of training about it, about how to spot the victims of human trafficking, which apparently is an epidemic now. And I looked him right in the eyes and I said, I'm pretty sure that it's either 99% or 100% bullshit. That's my only question is that it's 99 or 100 I still have not found clear evidence of even a single case, really, of sex trafficking that was clearly coercive, physically coercive. Have you? In this country, in this country. Yes. Yeah? Who? When? Where? Um, I'm trying to think, and I don't know. I I definitely have, but, or at least where they were, you know, the people were saying that it was, and there was no reason not to believe it. Okay. But... I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely rare. And also, it's never a lot of people. I mean, this is what I'm always trying to tell people. Like, they're like, does this exist? And it's like, whenever I see it seem like a case where there's legitimately bad things happening, it's like one or two, you know, pimps or traffickers or whatever, and like one to three, like, sex workers involved, usually only one of, one of them who's sort of on the side of the, you know, who's being charged also with human trafficking. So it's like, even if there was force, and, and I'm not, you know, a lot of times, I think that they're, 
sure, like, of course, there's sometimes going to be force and coercion used within, you know, within prostitution. But I just think that it's it's situations that are very small and isolated and, you know, usually often involved in someone who's like a runaway or has a serious drug problem or is in love with the person, you know, and thinks that they're a partner. It's more like a mm-hmm. domestic violence, right. you know, partnership that situation than... You know, so I think, yeah, I'm always trying to tell people, like, of course, sex trafficking, and I'm using the quotes here since you guys can't see this, you know, happens, but it's it's situations like that. It's not, I've never seen any, you know, yeah, I read so many charges of cases about this, and I've never seen anything like the, like, someone literally kidnapped and abducted right. and, and held against. And enslaved. And, and, yeah, and held enslaved. against their will. Yeah, no. Because that's the word they use. Right. Yeah. Slavery. I, yeah. Slaves. So if you're saying like that, like, I've no, I've never seen a case like that. When yeah. I'm talking, they're being yes. forced. It's like, you know, so they okay. might have a gun and they might use threats and say you can't leave and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. I've never seen someone being like, I've never seen a case where someone. Yeah, the actual sex slave. Is being, yeah abducted right. and taken and whatever. Right, right, yeah. right, right. That's exactly right. Yeah, I've seen not a single case of that. Yet there are millions of Americans, including oh, directors yeah. of hospitals, apparently, and probably people with even higher power like Kamala Harris, who actually believe that there, I guess that there are thousands or millions of sex sl- women, I guess in what, chained to radiators yeah. in dungeons in basements or something all over this country. People believe this. What was it? Was the idiot uh, actor who was pushing this? Ashton Kutcher. Right. Yeah. What did he say? How many millions did he, did he say at one point? Like they he, used to say, three hundred thousand children. Uh, children, just yeah, children. Children each year. Slaves. And it Sex turned slaves. out it was from this crazy study where they just like made up things like inside, are your parents divorced inside the United. Probably a sex slave. Oh, wow. That was literally. The, I mean, because it was it was actually like you're at risk. Then everybody left out the at risk, and oh. even the at risk part was bullshit. But yeah, the whole thing was just. Oh, that's how they got the number. Was yeah. at risk. Yeah. So I was at risk. And yeah, it was like this I was at risk. huge criteria. Like, you know, half the kids in America were like at risk. For your majority. Of course. But yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And no. it's, if you poke, yeah. So that's the thing. If you poke anything, if you poke any statistic in that vein, I mean, and that's what I've found over covering this has just been sort of, I didn't come in with this idea like this whole thing must be bullshit. It was kind of like, oh, like I'm writing about sex work and now everyone's like, well, what about the human trafficking epidemic? And I was like, well, I should figure out what's going on there. And mm-hmm. then it's. Every single time, though, you see those headlines about the big human trafficking busts. It's not. It's just not. To believe that there are 300,000 child sex slaves inside the United States, not in Mumbai, in the United States, is amazing. I did the math in one of my articles that reason. I think it's the first was the war on sex trafficking is the new war on drugs. It's like the first reason feature I did in 2015 about this. And I did the math and I forget what it was. But yeah, I mean, it was some absurd amount. If you broke that down, it would be some absurd amount of people that like grown men would have to be like paying children for sex every day. And it was just, yeah. That was that was a great piece. And I read that. And that's when I think I think that may have been when I first noticed you. And it was a huge piece. Everyone should go read that. It's that's when I thought, oh, my God. We have someone on our team who's actually doing well, yeah, this. Because you had just written something about the the roots of that, the like white slavery. Oh, is that what it was? That. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, because I read that when I first started at Reason. I think you would that article okay. had just come out not long before that. Yeah, and in that article, I said I couldn't find a single piece of evidence of any kind of sex slavery during the white, the great white slavery yeah. panic a hundred years ago, and I can't, I still can't find any now inside the states, right? right? Um, and you and I both basically agreed on that, right? Yeah, we, con- we connected the history with the present. Yeah, together. Yeah, which is also fascinating. Just yeah, totally. Um, gosh, this was fun. Yeah. I, um, I'm still deeply disappointed with your choice Coconut. of flavor. Um, I'm going to think about it more. Yeah. I'll get back to you on that. I don't know. I don't know if we can still be friends. But are you, well, we, I mean, we are you be, anti-coconut in general? Cause we can still be colleagues. If you're okay, anti-coconut it's, it's in fine. general, then, then, then we can't be friends. Actually. No, I love coconut. Sorry. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's fine. We can still work together. Uh, just we'll have uh, different drinks, but... Thanks for doing this. This has been really fun. And, and I, love, I loved all the things I learned about you. I got <laughs> lots of fun surprises with this one. <laughs> Probably going to regret this one. <laughs> when, I, when I come to D.C., I'm all like just I get into this you know, mode where I'm just going to talk politics and that's all it's going to be. It's just going to be politics and policy, blah, blah, blah. So it was good that you opened up and told awesome. us things that you've never told other people. I hope, I hope um, you won't regret it. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Thank you. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.